41. Let us hear the word of the Lord together. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city of which you say, it is being given into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. See, I am going to gather them from all the lands to which I drove them in my anger and my wrath and in great indignation. I will bring them back to this place, and I will settle them in safety. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me for all time, for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them, never to draw back from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts, so that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing good to them, and I will plant them in this land in faithfulness, with all my heart and all my soul. This is the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks.
Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But you, when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good and blessed, Lord, we pray that you speak in this place, Lord, as we meditate on your word. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our strength and our Savior. Amen. So, at this point, a lot of people have noticed and a lot of commentators have talked on and on about how uh, Americans seem to be more angry than we used to be. In fact, uh, several polls done by Pew Research Center, which I think is still a pretty reputable organization, uh, they've looked at uh, this question. They've asked people about how angry they are about uh, politicians, about the direction of the country, about all these kinds of things. And they find that compared with 20 years ago, Americans do say we report being significantly more angry than we were back in the year 2000, around the turn of the century. And I've been trying to understand this, and I've seen it, you know, around me and in me at times. And there are lots of theories and, and, and reasons why people suggest this might be the case, and none of them are going to be particularly surprising. People blame the politicians or parenting or schooling. People blame fear-mongering on cable news or rage bait on social media. People blame the decline of religious commitment among many Americans, or even chemicals that we're exposed to in our food and packaging and things that were unknown 100 years ago. And maybe all of these and more are contributing factors. But one of the things that kind of strikes me, just kind of thinking about what I'm often keyed in on, which is, which is habits and spiritual practices is, and how they affect our hearts, it seems to me a lot of us are just on lookout sometimes Maybe some of us are on the lookout all the time for things to be mad and angry about. And some of us, I think, were trained to kind of look at the world this way. And as I've thought about this, I've thought about my own experience actually in seminary. In seminary, they teach you lots of things, some of which is useful. And one of the things that they try to teach you uh, is how to interpret the Bible, right? I mean, that's kind of important. We're supposed to be good interpreters of the Bible, those of us who are preachers. Uh, the big word for that is hermeneutics. They, they teach us different ways to approach hermeneutics, the interpretation of the Bible. And so when I was in seminary, we learned a bit about, uh, but not as much as you might think, uh, how the early church interpreted the Bible, how John and Charles Wesley, the founders of the Methodist movement, how they uh, interpreted the Bible, how uh, some of the great theologians have sort of multiple layers of reading the Bible all at the same time. There's like an allegorical and a historical and, and all these different things, spiritual readings, all kind of wrapped in together. But when I was in school, we spent the vast majority of our time focused on basically 20th century approaches to interpreting the Bible, and particularly what's called the hermeneutic of suspicion. The hermeneutic of suspicion comes out in different forms of what's called liberation theology, and it basically says when you read the text, you need to always be asking, who is dominating who? And who is being oppressed? What are the agendas of the people who wrote the text? We need to be suspicious, in other words. We need to have a kind of skepticism. We need to be always trying to peel back layers to find out where there is oppression going on, where there's oppression being papered over or covered up. We need to have this hermeneutic of suspicion, always looking in every text we read, biblical text and other texts too, for where's the injustice? Where is the oppression? This was kind of focused on so much that my Greek teacher in seminary kind of lamented. When did theology stop being about God and become all about who is oppressing who? But this, as I was thinking about this, connects back to what I think is a really important spiritual principle. We've all experienced this, which is you're going to see what you're looking for very often. If you're looking for something all the time, you're probably going to see it. We used to play this game. My brother played this game a lot when we were on road trips looking for yellow cars. Anybody ever played the yellow car game? And you win if you count the most yellow cars because they're not that common. And it's amazing. You play this game for enough, and then it's like you see yellow cars. Like for the rest of your life, you're like, yellow car, yellow car. 
Because you kind of train yourself to see the world this way, right? That's what often happens. So if you're looking always and everywhere for some injustice, for some unfairness, for, for how somebody has maybe mistreated you, if you're looking for something to be upset and mad about all the time, guess what you're going to see? And what kind of person do you think you're going to become? If that is your main focus, the lenses through which you look at everything. Now, of course, the Bible clearly calls us to pay attention to justice and injustice, to, to look out for the needs of the oppressed and the downtrodden and those who can't take care of themselves. But the Bible also reminds us that it's very easy to look at how other people contribute to injustice and miss how we ourselves contribute to it. And that's the one part of injustice that we can usually do the most to remedy the fastest, my own contributions. Jesus said, you know, you got to be careful about having these judgmental eyes where all you see is how other people are screwing up the, the speck in your brother's eyes in Matthew chapter 7 while missing the log in your own eye, right? We need to pay attention to how we contribute to the problems in our world and not just be focused on what somebody else has done wrong. But I think the Bible also teaches us we need to be sensitive to injustice and oppression but that needs to be balanced. That doesn't need to be the only thing we're looking at all the time. It needs to be balanced with gratitude for the good things and the good people and the good work that's being done around us. Otherwise, we get a skewed worldview. We get a skewed way of looking at things, and we become resentful, angry people. And I think that has happened to our culture to a great extent. And I was thinking about this. If you have this kind of suspicion way of looking at things that we were taught at seminary, and that was just how you looked at everything, as they told us you should, um, you would miss so much. Imagine going into the Sistine Chapel in Rome. If you're ever there, you should go into the Sistine Chapel. And, and you should go early in the morning so you don't have the experience we had, which is being shoulder to shoulder with like 10,000 other people going like this. Yeah. Um, so that's, if you're ever there, go early. <laughs> the door's open. But if you go into the Sistine Chapel, you'll see this glorious artwork that Michelangelo painted all over the ceiling and on the walls and the whole place. It's not really all that big. And, and you could go in there with the, the suspicion glasses on. And you could go in there and go, I wonder if the guys who built the scaffolding in here were paid a fair wage. Probably not. And I wonder if the minerals that were used to create the colors and the pigmentation, I wonder if it was fairly and equitably sourced or if it was taken by exploitation from some poor community somewhere across the world. And you would look at the pictures and, and you would say, I wonder if the depictions of Adam and Abraham are ethnically correct or if this is basically uh, a racist painting. Or I wonder, I wonder if Michelangelo has some sexist views. Maybe we should go view his Twitter feed from when he was in high school and see what kind of jokes he was telling. You know? I mean, you could go into the all of life like this, looking for something to be upset about and mad about. You could pick things apart. You could deconstruct, as they say, everything you see. You could say, maybe we ought to paint over the Sistine Chapel. Maybe there's, there's just too much, there's too much problem there. Everything is tainted by injustice. Now, the truth is, if you go to the Sistine Chapel, you're going to see the story of the Bible. You're going to see that, that famous uh, creation where, you know, Adam's kind of lifeless hand and God's potent hand is about to, like, spark it into life. Uh, and you'll see all the sweep of the Bible all the way to up, up front, the last judgment where Christ returns. And one of the things that the great sweep of the Bible tells us is, yeah, we are fallen. Every human institution, every human achievement is tainted by sin and injustice to some extent. But there's a Redeemer coming to set things right. That, that, that fallenness is not the whole of our story. Even if you look at human achievements with the sober knowledge, as the Bible says, that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, you can still go into the Sistine Chapel and say... You could go in there and you could say, wow, I'm so thankful that God gives people gifts of creativity, that I can live in a world where there's beautiful things, things that I could never create myself. 
I'm so thankful that God has shared these gifts in the world. And ultimately, I'm so thankful that even in this great, great story that I live in of, of fall and corruption in the world, there is a redeemer and a redemption. We could go in there with those kind of eyes to look and see what God is up to and to see the beauties around us and to say, There are different ways you might look at your life, your relationships, the things that happen to you, the things that you do to other people. There are different ways you might look at the Sistine Chapel. And there are different ways that Jesus might look at Peter in John 21. Peter, this leader of the apostles. Peter, who just a few days prior so bravely told Jesus at the Last Supper, I'm ready to go and fight with you. I'm ready to go die with you, Jesus. And Peter, who after bravely announcing this, quickly chickened out and backed away and denied three times that he even knew Christ. He denied his best friend. He denied his Lord and Savior because he was afraid. What does Jesus see when he looks at Peter and by extension at any of us? What does Jesus see when he looks at Peter? Does he just see a failure? Does he see the guy who, when push came to shove, dropped the ball and chickened out? Does he see a man who has broken his promises and abandoned his dearest friends, broken faith with his Lord, a cowardly man who lacks integrity? Is that what Jesus sees and nothing else when he looks at Peter? Or does Jesus see a man haunted by grief, but a man with great potential, a man with great gifts and, and charisma, a man who really is ready desperate for some redemption in his life. John 21, this passage we read, really is the redemption and the restoration of St. Peter. That's what it's about. And there's so many rich details just everywhere in John's gospel. Peter and some other disciples decide to go fishing one day, and Jesus appears to them on the shore. And verse 1 says it twice, and then verse 14 says it again. This is how Jesus showed himself, revealed himself, some translations say to them. He's revealing himself to them. And in verse 7, there's this detail that's always struck me as really weird. Maybe it struck you that way as well. In verse 7, it says that Peter was naked as he's fishing. And some translations say he was stripped down for work or something like that. And unlike ancient Greek athletes, ancient Jewish people would no more hang out with their friends naked than we would. And so probably Peter's wearing like the ancient equivalent of his swimming trunks while he's working in this boat, as some of us might also do. But when he sees Jesus, it says he put on more clothes, and then he jumped into the water to swim to shore. And that's always struck me as weird. Why would you put on more clothes if you're about to go swimming? The point that John, I think, is trying to underline for us is that Peter feels guilty. Just like Adam and Eve. Back in the book of Genesis, in chapter 3, they, they took the forbidden fruit, they sinned against God, they fell, and they realized they're naked, and they felt naked, and the first thing they did was they tried to cover their nakedness before the Lord. They, they sewed fig leaves together to try to make little outfits or something. They tried to put on more clothes. And so this outward act of Peter is showing, he is showing what's going on in his heart. He feels guilty. He doesn't feel like he can be before the Lord because of what he's done. And then Peter has this conversation with Jesus that really, again, in subtle ways, John is highlighting this. Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? And we're told that this conversation happens in verse 9. It says, over a charcoal fire. And the Greek word for charcoal fire is an anthrakion. And it occurs only one other place in the entire Bible. It's in John chapter 18, verse 18. Where in the courtyard of the high priest's house, Peter's having a conversation with servants of the high priest. And in the flickering light of that charcoal fire, he denies that he knows Jesus three times. And now over the same fire, the same kind of fire, Jesus asks Peter three times, you denied me. Do you love me? He gives him the chance, in other words, to give the right answer. Where he has given the wrong answer. Jesus is giving, it's beautiful. He's giving Peter the chance to get it right. Where before, he's gotten it wrong. He's offering Peter redemption. Jesus doesn't ignore what Peter's done. He draws it out 
in a gentle way in order to completely deal with it. And let Peter know that it's been completely dealt with. And this process is not comfortable for Peter. Verse 17 says he felt hurt during this healing operation. But this is the way Christ is offering him a new beginning, a redemption, a restoration. Because that's what Jesus does. That's who Jesus is. For Peter, for you, for me, that's what Jesus does. The passage began by saying Jesus was revealing himself to his apostles. And he is. He's revealing what kind of a Savior he is. He's revealing what the heart of God is like. He's showing himself. He's the same Lord, the God of mercy, who back in Jeremiah 32 promised that he would restore his wayward people. Even though they'd gone wrong, he was going to bring them back home again. And he was going to be their God. And they were going to be his people. Give them a new beginning. When Christ offers Peter this gift of redemption and restoration, he also gives him a job to do. He says, he says feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Peter's experienced God's redeeming grace, and now Jesus says, go share that with other people so that they too can experience it. They can be nourished. They can be whole. They can be saved. Peter screwed up, but Christ looks at him, and he sees an opportunity to redeem a broken heart, a broken man. So also with us, no matter how much we might deviate from the right path, Jesus wants us. To redeem us. He wants to restore us. He wants to give us a new, fresh beginning. That's who Jesus is. That's what he wants to do. He's the redeemer. He wants to be our God. And he wants us to be his people. Douglas LeBlanc of Chesterfield, Virginia, tells a story. I thought it was kind of beautiful. He says, one of my fondest memories as a child is going to a Christmas Eve service. And singing Angels We Have Heard on High alongside my father. He said, I was about nine years old. We went to church every now and again. We always went for Christmas. He said, Dad was a shy man. And usually when we went to church, he would kind of mumble along with the hymns. He didn't sing them out. But that night, he was singing full, full voice, you know, off key, as loud as he could. And this yearning within him that I can, I can sense, even as a child, he said. And the other thing I remember about that night is that Dad was drunk that night. In church. He was a battered man. He had fought in World War II. He had seen many of his friends and brothers in arms killed in, in horrific ways. And after the war, he sought refuge, as many did, in alcohol, which made life pretty scary, uh, said Douglas, for mom and for us kids sometimes. He said, a few years after that Christmas Eve service, my older brother became what they called in those days a Jesus freak. Anybody remember the Jesus freaks? He said, my older brother became a Jesus freak, and my dad, for the first time in his life, started reading the Bible because he wanted to tell my brother how wrong he was and how he had gone off the track and, and, and into extremism, you know. And he said, but my dad discovered something as he read the Bible that he didn't know before. He discovered the heart of Jesus. And he began to pray, really pray, for the first time in his life. And he said, then amazing things started to happen. For one thing, his drinking stopped. And I said, my dad still struggled with anger. It didn't just go away. And we still argued and we still fought. We fought and argued about my long hair, says Douglas, and my failure to do my homework and practice the piano. But even still, over time, our relationship changed. And it became more a relationship of love than a relationship of just fear. Douglas was talking about how the grace of God changed his dad. And therefore changed his whole family. The whole dynamic changed. There was restoration. This man was redeemed. And their family got a second chance at having love, at having intimacy, at having something healthy and whole. Have you got something that you need to deal with with Jesus today? Something that makes you feel unworthy to be in his presence. You want to kind of cover yourself up. Have you got something you need to confess to Jesus? In the quiet moments as we come to the sacrament, tell him what's going on. Hear his words of forgiveness. Because they are for you.
Are you holding on to something, maybe, some injustice that you've experienced, some ugliness that somebody has done to you? Are you holding on to something that's making you a mad and resentful and embittered person? Are you hanging on to some hurt, some wound that somebody has dealt you? Tell Jesus about it. Ask him to help you, to forgive. He knows how to do this. He can help you. He can give you that grace. Have you known the goodness of God in your life? Have you known the restoration, the grace of God in your life? Go tell somebody about it. Like Peter, we're all commissioned to go and to share the good things that God has done in us and for us and in this world. People might not notice. Sometimes we need to point them out. Share what God has done. What has God done? Who do you know that needs to hear about a redeemer? Let's pray. Bless the Lord, help us truly to wrestle with these questions as we come in prayer, as we come to receive the sacrament, as we come to receive your presence and your grace in holy communion. Help us remember our, our charge, our commission as we go out into this community, out to the restaurants, out to our family dinner tables, out to our work.